Cool. So I think where I wanted to start is you had posted something on LinkedIn. I think it was last week or the week before last. And I think it's really, really timely what you said around how B2B SaaS companies really need to be focusing on certain activities and channels. And you mentioned four different, we'll call them activities or channels that you're not going to be investing in in 2023. And uh, so I wanted to kind of break that down in terms of context of like what you meant by that, because I think everyone right now clearly has either had budgets cut potentially, they've maybe lost a team member or two or more if it's a bigger company, especially on the marketing side. So as always, us marketers need to do everything all at the same time and be a jack or jill of all trades. So I think everyone's clearly thinking about, hey, where do I focus? How do I do more with less and all that type of language? But I wanted to see if you like maybe just break down like that LinkedIn post, if you remember it, where you talked about community webinars, ABM, social ads, and some things that maybe you were going to push off a little bit. And then uh, we can kind of dive into it from there. Yeah, I originally created that post because I don't know about anyone else, but 2023 hit and I was like, oh my God, all the things I didn't get done in 2022, all these things yeah. I've been planning, like the holidays is always your planning time. Like now I have to execute. And all yep. you're seeing on LinkedIn is 2023, here's the five things you should be doing or five <laughs> strategies. So I was like, okay, I want to make a post that's a little different from that, that yep. just says, hey, here's what I'm not doing because as a marketer, we can't do everything. Exactly. And these aren't bad strategies. I want to make that perfectly clear. I think a lot of these are honestly on my wish list of things. If I had the team or the budget or even the experience mm -hmm. to do some of these things, I would. But just yeah. for my own not only just for my own self experience and best practices, but also, you know, what we can afford to do as a company. These mm. were things that we decided not to invest in and happy to break down each one, like why we personally decided not to. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's year. start with that. Cause I mean, I think community is always the big one. I mean, everyone loves to talk about build a community, build a media company, just get a bunch of people together on a Slack uh, network and it's easy. And uh, then you'll create this whole, nurture flow where you can kind of curate everyone and we all know like it's not that easy it takes a lot of work and you need to have a team obviously behind it and it's successful so i'm assuming those are probably some other reasons for that but yeah walk me through what are you thinking in terms of community like why not why not community right now at least for you guys i think you hit it on the head not only is it a lot of work but it's really a lot of, it's a different skill set than most marketers and i don't think we give yeah. that enough credit the best community people i've met didn't necessarily come from B2B SaaS marketing. Like I came mm. from a growth hacking background, SEO, SEM. That is not the same skill sets as getting someone to engage in a Slack channel. Yeah. I also, on top of that, honestly could not think of a new angle for community. I think we've mm. all probably been faced with at some point, like make a community and then you go out and you do your research and realize there are 10 Slack groups on there. Yeah. So at least for now, between those two things, I didn't feel like it was the right time. Maybe something we'll come back to, but I'm a pretty yeah. big proponent of if I don't have a new angle on something, I don't want to do it. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I mean, I don't know, maybe it's just me because I don't have as much time, but I'm in all these different Slack communities. And I would love, there's some great conversations happening there. And I'd love to be a part of them all the time. But it's just, there's there's so many that are constantly springing up of a lot of the same types of people too, like marketing Slack communities. I mean, there's tons. I mean, there's an immense amount of marketing Slack communities and you can get involved in them, but it's like, which ones do you choose to focus in? And, you know, even still, even once you do, it's, it's tough. So I think on the like consumer side of it, for me, I think there's a tough aspect that to your point, there is a lot already out there. And so you can't necessarily, it's, I mean, unless you have something that's going to be very different in terms of the angle or approach you're taking, then it's just kind of like another one. And then you're trying to just steal some people out from other communities and groups to grow your own. And then I think for everyone else, that's you know, a listener, a silent observer, it becomes kind of tough to, you know, go through them all, right? I've also noticed a bit what you're saying in the beginning, just overall less engagement in a lot of communities. And a lot, I still see yeah. great engagement, especially ones that focus on a niche. But overall, I think community worked really well during the pandemic when we were all at home. We mm. all had a little extra free time. I don't know about anyone else, but it feels like in-person events are really taken over some of that free time as well as just like mm. getting back to everyday <laughs> normalcy. So I think that's a little bit of it as well as just that, as you said, people are overwhelmed. There are almost too many communities to keep up with. So I know I've right. at some point just been like, oh, I'm just going to ignore my slacks for now. Like I'm going to focus on other channels. Right, exactly. And then the other one you mentioned was webinars too, which is an interesting one to me because I think that it seems like every SaaS company we talk to is wanting to start a webinar and to do a webinar series and to try to keep with the cadence of, you know, every two weeks or one week for some that are more aggressive and have a webinar constantly be going out. 
to get people together to hopefully not do too much product pitching, but also like delivering content through another medium. And I feel like the thing that I keep saying and is a lot of folks taking more like a podcast conversational style approach and making it more AMA based and trying to change it up because a lot of people have kind of gotten old from even the name webinar and you just kind of know that you're coming into a monologue presentation of 40, 50 slides or whatever with one person talking and there's not a lot of back and forth. So I think it's gotten not as interesting, but then I think now so many SaaS companies, at least what we're talking to you are trying to take more of that approach where it's almost like you and I just talking right now, like this could be, a, this is really a webinar, right? We just do it live. We'd have a chat. We'd have some people that we could kind of chime into the conversation and everything like that. But what's your take? So, I mean, clearly kind of budget resources on, on webinar too, or there's some other kind of decisions you said, Hey, you know what, maybe we should kind of postpone this and do something differently to get people together. I think more option two, as far as postponing, the reason being, we're thinking of doing content this year. Like we want to do video series. We have one that should be coming out next week. We have another one that should be coming out in a few weeks. Yeah. And so we're definitely focusing on, you know, how can we make videos that we can repurpose into blog posts, social posts, you know, trip campaigns, all that. But to start, we were thinking, you know, we don't even know if these are going to be successful content series. Sometimes you have the best idea and it just doesn't hit or does better than others. Yeah. So we thought like, let's do this pre-recorded. And then if it's successful, let's open it up to a webinar. And yeah. I think that eliminates some of the burden sometimes with marketing teams because you don't have to worry about registration lists. You don't have to worry about going perfectly on the live call. You don't have to mm. worry about following up with everyone. It can be more about the content itself and you can mm. test that out before you dive into the whole live show production. Mm. Agreed, agreed. Well, that's a lot. I mean, certainly to keep the cadence up, there's a lot of work as always too. It's not like you just do this one time and expect, okay, great. Like everyone's gonna love us. It's gonna be great for brand awareness. It's going to drive all these inbound demo requests. And everything's going to be great. I mean, most most companies, I mean, you need to keep this up for months. I mean, Clearbit, for example, I mean, it's been on this for years. And the reason they can get thousands of, I mean, they, I think the one webinar that we did, there were 1,500 to 2,000 people registered, and I think about 500 people on the webinar or something like that. And, I mean, that's a lot of people. Uh, but that doesn't come overnight, right? It's not like they just started doing it. They've been doing it for forever. So you just have to be committed to, you know, have that approach. So, okay, so we're talking about community webinars. The other one, a big one on your list was no ABM, which is always a fun one because I feel like I hear nothing more than just people talking about ABM or wanting to do ABM. And it's been, it still continues to be like one of the biggest things. I still think at the end of the day, it's just kind of good marketing and people overcomplicate it. But uh, what's your take? So this is another one of those things where I want to make it clear, I'm not anti-ABM. I've done ABM at past companies. I yeah. think it can be an amazing strategy. But I think this is really when you evaluate where are you in your growth and also what's your addressable market. We're yeah. pretty lucky. We sell to SaaS companies. It's a pretty big market. So we don't have to worry as much about going after very specific, huge ACV accounts. Mm. We are more at the stage where, you know, we're trying to get market awareness. We have a little bit of natural product led growth. The more companies that see our interactive demos, the more mm -hmm. people learn about interactive demos. So this one is rather than resources constraint, it's much more just like in our growth stage, makes a lot more sense for that. Let's focus on getting the word out there and yeah. getting us known versus just known in a handful of accounts. Do you guys think about using like target account list even and not, you know, for example, clearly ABM is much more than just target account list. It's, you know, spe specific content, personalization, a bunch of other things, right? But do you guys think about it with targeting specific actual accounts or are you still taking much more of a broader approach when it comes to like brand awareness? We do have a, a like a target account list. We do have some, I'd say ABM light, like not full ABM campaigns going on towards that, yeah. those top companies. But funny enough, and this kind of going into what channel am I focusing on? I've noticed myself doing more ABM for like partners I want to work with. Hmm. I have a list of partners and companies that I would love to do co-marketing with. And it, I wouldn't even call it traditional ABM. It's more just like trying to connect with people, but figuring out how can I get to those accounts versus huh. spending my time figuring out how to like sell those accounts. Huh. That's interesting. We've seen another example of some clients doing uh, some investor related targeting for raising their next round even and getting on the, the radar of tons of different investors, which I thought was kind of interesting. And they wanted us to run a campaign on, hey, we're trying to get to our series B. Can we launch a campaign that's kind of more brain awareness talks about our strategic narrative? So that when you reach out to these VCs, they're like, okay, yeah, I've, I've actually heard of you guys before. I've seen some, some of your ads or something like that to increase familiarity. So 
but yeah, I think, you know, with ABM, ABM doesn't need to be this kind of like full blown metal jacket thing. I think there's like some baby steps around saying, okay, cool. We've got, for example, we do with a lot of our clients is we'll have sales teams clearly got always a target account list. I've never heard of a sales team that doesn't, right? So there's always one and they've maybe got that split into tier one, two, three, or whatever the, the groupings are. And then ultimately what we want to do is just make sure we've got some campaigns that are uh, targeting the same types of accounts so that we're increasing familiarity, brand awareness, so that when they're doing outreach or outbound or whatever, whether they come inbound or not, clearly from a marketing perspective, we'd love to just say, hey, no sales, like we did the work, you know, like warn them up, pass them through retargeting layers, a couple different things that we're doing, and um, yeah, they're, they're ready to go. So clearly that'd be the ideal state, but I think with ABN, you can always take an approach where Maybe you don't have all the customized content for every persona or industry or this, that, and the other thing and all the other mechanisms need to take place. But you can still say, hey, we know that these are the accounts that we want to hit. We know there's ones that we want to win because these are the ones that sales are targeting. Let's just at least just make sure it's got campaigns that are specific to those types of companies. And then obviously you can go the deeper approach like you know and you've done in the past where you go a lot deeper in terms of customization of content because it's a lot of work. And if your ACVs aren't there, then, uh, then you're in trouble. So... And I'd add, we are doing like industry specific, verticalized, even sometimes hmm, not even cool. industry, but like top PLG companies, for example, like we will bucket oh, yeah. out our outreach. It's just, as yeah. you mentioned, not this specific account I'm going after. So you could say, I know I've heard ABM defined as like one to many, one to some, one to one, maybe right. we're doing the one to some approach, some right. level of ABM, but for the most part, we prioritize channels that have a wider reach than necessarily a smaller reach. Yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Well, there's a natural segue because, I mean, you know, ads seem to always get tied up into any ABM strategy as always. But I know you guys are taking an approach where you're not going to spend money just yet on social ads just because of, I think, one thing you said, if I'm remembering correctly, but just a lot of um, marketers that are very critical and analytical of ads themselves to make sure that you guys really nail the messaging, make a good impression because clearly marketers are your customer at the end of the day. But what's your thought process there? Like why not social ads or have you guys done them in the past maybe and just decided to turn them off or what's the story there? So I'd say two main reasons. The first one you hit on, you know, we sell to marketers, they know a good ad from a bad ad. And not that I don't think we couldn't, you know, create a hundred variations of ads, optimize them and get one that really resonates. Yeah. But I'd rather experiment more organically to see what stands out in a few different ways versus jumping right into ads. Mm. But I think more so than that is really just resources and budget. I've experimented with LinkedIn ads, not here, okay. and also like Facebook social ads at other companies. And it is a lot of budget hmm. if you need someone really optimizing those ads. Like the hmm. most success I've seen is, again, you have a lot of different variations. You're constantly testing them. And just hmm. in all honesty, I haven't had the bandwidth yet to plug that in. Maybe eventually we'll get an agency. Maybe we'll hmm. find it. But from we've seen success so far organic, so we're going to focus there first and then eventually open up, open up more with LinkedIn ads. But this, again, right. is really more those prioritization rather than we don't think it would work. Right. So I literally just got off a call yesterday with a company similar size as you all, kind of in the series. And you guys are series A, series B, right? Around there? Yeah. Yeah. So some similar size. And they were having the same conversation about advertising. And we had uh, a conversation around, all right, well, where are you from a messaging perspective? How confident do you feel you are with messaging to the given ICP that you had? And their answer was not really at all. Like we feel very uncertain with exactly the messages we should be delivering to the audience. So for me, that was kind of a red flag. And I said, well, wait, before we start pouring a lot of money, sure, you can do testing on ads and all sorts of things, but if we're really early on, and they were probably a little bit more immature than you guys even still, then you know you almost need to say, what are some other channels, other things that we can do this a little bit cheaper uh, to begin with? Because paid ads is kind of a, you know, if you've got a fire that's really going and you pour some gas on it, great. You know, it explodes and it goes bigger. If you've got kindling going and you pour a bunch of gas on, fire goes out. You know, so ultimately you, you kind of need to wait to the right moment. But for you guys, what was the, what are, I guess, the signals you're going to be looking for in terms of messaging where you say, hey, cool, I think we've got things kind of locked in here. I think we're hearing the right messages. And maybe you're saying you're using some of the organic feedback you're getting from LinkedIn posting and other things you're doing. Like, what does that look like? I mean, how does even one determine you know, hey, this is the moment, like, let's do it. Or is there a good one? <laughs> I don't know about that magic moment yet. I'll let yeah. you know. I think honestly, it's more in what quarter can we fit it into the priorities list. But mm -hmm. as far as knowing when to ramp it up, really what we're doing this quarter and prioritizing is focusing, like I said, on organic and really testing and seeing which of these posts, which of these messages 
does the best. Mm -hmm. We're using shield analytics to see not yep. only our posts, but some other people's posts, like which ones are resonating. And then mm -hmm. from there, we've actually gotten the idea before to like use those social posts, use comments and just use those as your LinkedIn ads, which 100%. I think would be really cool. Cause I think it would seem as if it is, you know, kind of disrupt someone to see an ad of the platform they're using. So we mm -hmm. might try that out, but that's really what we're measuring this quarter. So we are, we are strategically thinking of different messaging, trying them out, trying to see what resonates. But I think we're waiting until just have enough time, honestly. Mm -hmm. It's more of that than like that magic moment when one hits, just enough time to try enough messaging. Exactly. So when you say organic, you mean like organic social posting on LinkedIn from personal accounts, right? You don't mean organic SEO and other things like that, right? That's the only thing you mean? I do mean organic social posting, but, and we'll get into this when we talk about what channels we are prioritizing. I think yeah. A lot of times we get some ideas for organic social posting from organic SEO content strategy. Got it. Got it. Cool. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Well then, yeah, then that's a good segue then. So clearly we talked about community webinars, EBM, social ads, all important, but things that we can't do at all, you know, it'd be cool if we could. And so the focus then now is really on organic social postings, clearly one thing we talked about, but what are some other things that you guys are doubling down on in 2023? So as I mentioned, I have a background in SEO. So no matter what, I always mm -hmm. will do SEO at companies, not just because of my background, because I think it's also a very good pillar. Sure. Like no matter what you want to make sure you have that baseline, you know, it's helping your website, you know, ranking, you know, it's helping getting the word out there, being seen as a thought leader. Mm -hmm. But I think what I've honestly, the best value I've gotten out of SEO and blog content is repurposing it for social. Yep. So the way we structure our blog content is I outline all of them and always try to think of, you know, what are some unique examples, customers, data that we have that make sure no one else could write this blog post. Hmm. Like unique proprietary like insights that come from Navitic itself, where you say like, hey, we've looked at a thousand B2B SaaS companies. Here's what we see when they launch product tours, things like that. Exactly. Yeah. And whether it's data or, as I mentioned, just customer examples that we have that we can pull from. Yeah. That makes sure then when we go and write the post and then eventually when I turn it into a LinkedIn post, I know it's something original and something you, don't, mm. you know, no one else could just necessarily post on LinkedIn. Exactly. And to make it clear, I try not to just like summarize the blog post or copy and paste it. I try to yeah. kind of take out the top points or as if I, I almost like go back to my outline and kind of use mm. that outline, then pull out some stats or data. And I've noticed those are some of my most successful posts. So mm. we're definitely going to be doubling or keeping our same content strategy, but not just because it helps with SEO. We do see a constant stream of leads come in from SEO, but as mm. well as fueling our other content. Got it. So you're taking blog posts, you're purposing those, summarizing them or creating highlights, kind of paraphrasing, right? Writing something a little bit different in terms of LinkedIn or other channels or just LinkedIn in terms of resharing and reposting? For now, just LinkedIn. Just Sometimes, LinkedIn. Cool. yeah, if we do like newsletters, we might promote them there, but mostly LinkedIn. Yeah. And then are you trying to get people back to that blog post? I haven't been noticing uh, or looking closely enough, but are you trying to like link back in the comments and do that type of thing? Or just purely like, hey, here's the content. You're connected with a lot of marketers, I'm sure. And get, getting people to read and consume that content, follow you and ultimately follow Navitech. Is that the idea or what's the, the play there? I'd say 50-50, we link back to that content, but we don't yeah. measure the success of the post based off of if they sure. went to the content. It's more, if you want to read more, here it is but exactly. it's more fueling the actual in LinkedIn engagement. Cause we also know LinkedIn doesn't really like to take you off the page. So oh, yeah. it tries to keep you there. Well, you're hitting on something I'm actually talking about in two weeks, which is uh, the whole idea of zero click ads and optimizing for channel consumption that I think we've been talking about for the last couple of years and uh, seems to continue to gain steam. Although a lot of people aren't really quite doing it yet. But I think another idea off your point is uh, we've seen some success with people taking blog posts, and then doing a short little like highlight video reel of like literally just you sitting exactly where you are and just giving a two minute summary of some things that, you know, the blog post is specifically discussing. For example, you could go and be like, hey, after looking at a thousand plus B2B SaaS companies, we found that these are the three most optimal use cases for driving conversion rate with product demos. Let me walk you through it, right? And you go boom, 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 and you kind of walk through the idea. And then, of course, you can use that for social, same way you do with your text-based posts. You can also use the video in the blog itself and you can use the asset in advertising mm -hmm. ultimately when you guys kind of gear that up. So I think there's so many cool now uh, use cases. Now, clearly that takes more time, right? You gotta do the video, you gotta make sure you know what you're gonna say and all that. But you know, if you're only talking about a minute and a half, two minutes, probably not too, too hard, uh, but I'm sure it comes out of time like anything, but another idea to kind of see. 
I've definitely seen some really cool examples of that. Not something we've tried yet, but I'll, I'm going to add it to that that backlog list of things I want to try. Yeah, I'm sure it's very long. It's, it's going to usually get longer and longer. Um, cool. So, so that's one thing. So we talked about that. Anything else that you'd add? So we talked about SEO, repurposing blog posts, getting it on social, et cetera. Are there some other things you guys are doubling down outside of, outside of that in terms of driving I acquisition? I mentioned this earlier, but like partnerships and in a few different forms. So hmm. yeah. partnering with creators, you create newsletters. That's one thing we just started experimenting with as well as just partnerships with other B2B SaaS companies. Hmm. So this might be a case where if they're hosting a webinar, maybe we will join it, or maybe we'll host, we'll do a co blog together that will turn into other forms of content, maybe a video or social posts. I think one thing that is really important with partnerships though, because I've seen it becoming more and more popular hmm. and it seems always so exciting. You, everyone wants to partner in something, but I see the actual execution of it is very hard. Like it, hmm. I have a lot of marketers who maybe reach out, like I want to partner, but then when it comes time to, getting it yeah. done, you know, everyone has their own priority list and completely right. get it. So I always say with partnerships, like start small. That's why we check typically start with a blog post or something like that. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, if your part, if your audience really resonates with it, you can promote it in multiple channels, they can promote mm -hmm. it in multiple channels, and then you could turn it into a webinar or a video series. But mm -hmm. I think sometimes even with partnerships, we have this idea, we have to jump off the bat and put it on our homepage and make it super official. There, there are ways to test before kind of diving all in. Yeah, yeah. I think partners can be great. I mean, you just made me think of something that's kind of pseudo related, which is just more co-marketing either with partners and or customers or their influencers and things like that. And I think that a lot of folks are doubling down on that, at least uh, some of the SaaS companies we're talking to and just saying, hey, great, here's a company, not exact, not a competitor per se, but they still market at the same type of audience. We can create some really great content on XYZ thing, share some audience between each other. Then especially too, which is great if, you know, say Navitic is, let's call it a growing brand, but it's not Salesforce yet in terms of brand recognition. And so then you pin yourself up to maybe not a Salesforce, but someone that has a slightly bigger brand reputation, all of a sudden then you get the association from Navitic to that other brand and draw that connection for people because everything goes by trust as you know all too well, right? So if I trust this other brand and then this other brand happens to be working with it, it's called Navitic, well, all of a sudden I'm thinking, wait a minute, maybe I should check these guys out. What are they up to? So you maybe kind of think about that in relation to partners. Have you guys been doing any like co-marketing stuff? Maybe you have and I just haven't noticed, but um, anything like that you guys are thinking about? You took the words out of my mouth as far as, that's a great way to sort of level up. I think one yeah. thing that we've been trying, because it's great to, you know, co-market with one of those big brands, but then someone's obvious next question is going to be, well, how do you get in front of them? Mm. And one thing we've been thinking about are what are ways that we can just start by creating content that's mutual beneficial to maybe co-customers. So again, if it's a company that's not a competitor, but they're in the space, you might use something like Crossbeam to see, maybe you have a lot of overlapping, mm. you know, prospects or opportunities or yep. customers. What's a way maybe we could do, doesn't even necessarily have to be in product, collaboration, but ways that you could mm. use your two tools together. Mm. So for example, we've had a few customers using us and mutiny to do like AB testing. Mm. And so we went in and created some piece of enablement around, okay, here we interviewed some customers. Here are the top three ways that you could use an interactive demo with um, AB testing. Mm -hmm. And then we helped coach some of our customers who are using the two platforms. We did reach out using Crossbeam. We knew which of those customers use both. We did yeah. reach out and say, hey, we see you using us plus this. Would you like a free coaching session? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good way to kind of get in the door with some of these companies rather than hmm. just jumping to, hey, do you want to co-market together? Because now you know you have content that's been validated by your customers as being interesting and valuable versus mm -hmm. just like pitching some random idea to them. I've heard of this, the tool Crossbeam. I've never used it myself, but the way it works is essentially you're just sharing customer lists with other potential partners so that you can see where you might have some commonalities. Is that the basic thing? And are you signing NDAs and everything like that? Or are you just kind of sync up your CRM and then Crossbeam kind of makes the connections between other potential partners? How does, how does it even work? I'm not sure. I'm sure people would be curious. We've had some partners where we sign NDAs, but generally it, yes, it just syncs up to your Salesforce. You yeah. can decide with each partner what level of data you want to show. So you could okay. just show the number count. Like if you don't want to show them the exact customers you have in common, you could just right. show, hey, we have this number of customers in common or prospects. Mm. I can validate that your prospects would probably be interested in, you know, some co-marketing. 
So oh, cool. you can kind of choose. It doesn't. You don't have to give them your entire serum database. Yeah, I was like thinking like people are probably not going to be comfortable with that. I'd say, here's my thousand list of clients. Uh, go for it. Have fun with it. I mean, clearly they're a partner, right? But still, I think always people are a little bit uh, careful as they should be with anything related to customer data. But that's cool. Well, let's kind of move on. I wanted to go um, just kind of skip down to one thing since we're kind of getting uh, a little bit short on time here. So in terms of anything maybe we haven't talked about yet today, I'm always trying to uncover some things that maybe are not so common. You know, you and I probably hear it's everyone says the echo chamber right on LinkedIn. There's a lot of things that I think people talk about on repeat to a degree, but are there any things maybe outside the norm that you guys are thinking about doing? Maybe that you haven't started yet, or maybe that you've already done and you started to see some success with, whether it's a specific tactic or a strategy or a channel or something that you guys have done, anything like that, or maybe pointing back to one of the things we've already talked about? Yeah. So to talk to this, I can kind of talk to the origin again behind that our original conversation, our original post of things I don't do. Yeah. I actually, before I even wrote that post, I commented somewhere that I don't do email marketing. It was like a thread oh, on right. LinkedIn. I think I saw that one. Yeah. 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 yeah I was like, what yeah. are some uncommon marketing things <clears throat> or what are some marketing controversies? And that, I, that is probably the most successful LinkedIn comment I've ever had. Just saying I don't really? do email marketing. I was like, huh, I think yeah. I might've struck a nerve here. And I think <laughs> the most uncommon thing we do is we just don't really do the concept of lead nurturing. Right. And I understand, well, maybe one day we'll have to get there again with everything I suggest. I think it depends on your stage, your industry, sure. your persona. Always. Always. But for us, I, and I think this plot t ties into dark social and just what we're seeing, but I think B2B buying is going to get closer and closer as everyone says to B2C, but in the way in consumer sales, you're not usually put on like a drip campaign and someone doesn't evaluate how far along. Yes, they have data to try to push you, but really when I buy something these days, it's usually because suddenly 10 of my friends have a pair of shoes that are really mm. cool and everyone's talking about them. And it's not like I see them in a nice linear fashion. It's mm. just suddenly these shoes are everywhere. Yeah. Uh, like I think there's this, pot. I love food Instagram. And there's just like pot that everyone's using. And suddenly, you know, I'm seeing it on Instagram everywhere. I'm seeing out of home display. I'm seeing yeah. it on TV and I'm not marking it as like, oh, one of these things convinced me to get it more than others. It's just the fact that it's yeah. constantly surrounding me that the second I buy a pot, I'm probably going to buy that one. Right. right. And that's sort of how I'm thinking about B2B buying these days, rather than obsessing over let me put this prospect into a specific funnel that I can nicely measure and say, this is this channel or this thing yep. made them this much more likely to buy. I'm just trying to do as many touches as possible in many different channels. Yeah. I think it's because we're overwhelmed with options these days that we'd almost rather just be like, you know, I've seen this one enough. It's good. I'm going to ask some friends about it. I'm still going to do my research, but I don't need them to send me 10 emails on mm -hmm. why I should buy them. Yeah, I think it's not necessarily, I guess my take on it is um, email's another channel like like many, right? I think the thing that I'm certainly opposed with as many marketers are, and, and this is shifting as you've seen, is the whole idea of someone took this action and then I'm going to send them these five emails, like you said, drip them through a waterfall based on click actions on each of the different emails. I'm going to push them over here or over there, ultimately to a goal of conversion or, or whatever the whatever the objective is. And I think, you know, that to me is, I think it's interesting to have the data to your point, but people don't move that way through journeys. And I think it'd be cool if they did. And I think that makes it so much easier for us as marketers, clearly, if we said, okay, they're going to start at the top of the funnel, consume that content, then they're going to go get some Bofu, and then they're going to get some Bofu, and then they're going to buy, and it's going to be great, you know? And I think, you know, HubSpot and others that, you know, kind of started that whole thing made it really easy to kind of think about how to organize content, which it's not to say you shouldn't organize it that way, but the buyer journey is not linear to your point. And you can't think about email journeys that way. But I am a fan of, um, I mean, newsletters have made a big comeback, I feel like recently. I mean, there's so many, honestly, it's it's probably just as crowded as the amount of communities that have sprung up over the last few years. But I think there's still a huge opportunity if you just have a great piece of you know content that goes out once a week, then I think you, you're in a, a really cool spot to just kind of have another channel to hit some people with the same type of content maybe you're writing on LinkedIn or your blog post. And if they missed your LinkedIn post because the algorithm didn't cooperate with you that day, didn't get into the desired audience you wanted to, you didn't quite get the engagement on the initial you know, first couple of hours, then you've got one other touch point, right? Whether they want to consume it there, LinkedIn or other, it's just another, another, another place. So, so again, I, I think, I think there's still always a place for all these things, but to your point, it sounds like, you know, again, back to focus, right? 
Exactly. And to clarify, I'm not anti-email. Actually, newsletters, more third-party newsletters, so we're advertising in them is something we're trying this year. Cool. And it's more just the concept of the lead the funnel, waterfall. lead nurturing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, the programmatic, you know, dripping people through, I think, I'm not sure if it was ever very effective, but certainly it's not the way people buy. But I do think, you know, I think there's some Great folks like Vlad and Andre, I'm sure you see on LinkedIn. I think what is really important is mapping the buyer journey and understanding what content you need across the various questions that someone will ask, but just allowing them to consume that content whenever they want to, you know, and making sure that your website has some of that content there so they can get those questions answered on their own terms. And I think that's the way that we all want to buy versus saying, all right, step two came down the funnel and now I'm ready, you know, type of thing. So... Well, cool. Well, let's wrap up with one thing because we can't not talk about it because it's the other big thing. Um, in fact, um, uh, G over at, uh, where is he now even? I can't remember, but he did a little thing with uh, Chili Piper recently about the 23 or something predictions or whatever. And he had mentioned uh, product tours in there, in that blog. And I think we've got to talk about it because between whether it's a product tour through a company like Navitic or other, or if it's just ungating demos and allowing people to actually see the demo itself versus having to fill out a form, get on a call with a sales rep, et cetera. I think like clearly a lot of SaaS companies, certainly more the modern ones, at least that we're talking to, are all open to this idea. I think it's the older school ones that have historically for, for many years driven people in and like, it's get the demo. We're not gonna show you actually what it looks like because we wanna, you know, kind of uh, control the conversation a little bit more with sales. So I'm just curious, like for the people that you're talking with in Navitic, why are people still hesitant about on getting the demo? What's the story two, there? Yeah, there's really been two main reasons that we've seen. One is for the longest time, honestly, there wasn't enough data on it. And that's some feedback we specifically got. You uh -huh. know, we're selling to marketers and growth personas. They tend to be very data driven. Yeah. And it was in the early stages where we were still getting that data from customers or that aggregate data. Um, so that's why we actually just put out a big report around just the state of the interactive product demo. So yeah. people can see, you know, what are the conversion completion rates, all that, and get a little bit more proof of, okay, this, this has worked for other people. It's not just a hype cycle right now. Yeah. And then I'd say number two is there is still a little bit of that fear of, you know, if they, I, they see my product up front, Will they still want to talk to my sales team? Will they still want to do my free trial? Or as always, what if my competitors see it? We're hearing that less and less because I think we all know at this point your competitors have access to your product in some way, shape, or form. It's probably on YouTube. I mean, you know, all it takes is you or me to just post a quick video and all of a sudden your demo's out for everyone. So I've seen that way too many times where yeah. suddenly you're like, oh, this is interesting. There is this video of my product or competitor's product yeah. now just on YouTube. But I think what we advise against that, if you're fearful of anyone seeing too much of your product and no longer being interested, you know, we say interactive demos should really be like a sneak peek, something to get someone excited about using your product. It shouldn't mm -hmm. be the full thing. Right. And that's, that's up to your company, how much you want to disclose. But we've seen that the optimal length for these interactive demos are about 10 to 15 steps. You're mm -hmm. not going to show your entire product in 10 to 15 little steps. Exactly. Really what you're showing is this is the end state. This is what you should get excited about. Here are the aha moments. And then that should then want, make someone want to go see more, or have additional questions. So we've generally seen that the best demos, again, shorter. They don't replace mm -hmm. the demo or free trial at all. They're just kind of like a sneak peek before. So you said something that's really interesting and I completely agree. And um, I think clearly you wouldn't do a, a whole entire demo of every aspect of your product. But I think the real big key is that I know your tool does well and also you can do just by recording a loom if you wanted to take that approach. But you know, creating context around where people are today and centering a demo around a given use case and making it specific to a given persona or ICP or whoever you're targeting this specific video too, whether it's just on your website and the collection. But I think to me, that's the key thing because so many product tours and ungated demos or whatever, it's just like, let me walk you through our product. This button does this. And when I click it, it does that. And I think like, you know, some of that, that's interesting, but without the context, then you immediately kind of lose all the value. And you really need that story from the beginning of where are they today? Like, what's the problem they have? And using the words you, right? Say, hey, you're probably in a situation where you're struggling with X, Y, Z. Like I was in that position too. It sucks. It's the worst, right? But let me show you actually how I solved this in like three simple steps, right? And you just walk through one little aspect of the product. 
And then you could create many of them. I assume a lot of your clients, right? It's not like you create one product tour. You can create hundreds if you want, or maybe not hundreds, but you know, 10, 10 or something very specific use cases. Is that, is that kind of how you see it or, or any difference there? We've actually seen this rise of customers using it for exactly what you described, but these demo yeah. libraries. So right. if you go to their website, there's one landing page that maybe it's a link to the demo, maybe it's a little screenshot preview, but yeah. it has it broken up by personas or use cases. So yeah, mm -hmm. as the visitor, I can go and say, I'm interested in this one specific use case. I don't need to watch or click through the rest of these. Right. Yeah, exactly. I think that's key, you know, and just making sure the headlines and you could have it open demo library, exactly like you mentioned it. I haven't seen many people do that. I think it's a great idea. I think the only company I can think of that comes to mind is Sixth Sense. I don't know if you've been to their website in a while, but they've got a area that's called something like Mojo Power or something kind of weird. I, don't, I forget what they call it. It's a lab or something they call it. But if you click into that, then there's all these like customized videos for different things. And it's their company using their tool and saying, hey, this is how I use it. I'm an SDR at Sixth Sense and here's kind of how I go about it. And then I think that's really cool because immediately now you're getting someone who's in the role talking about the thing they do, et cetera. And whether you do that through a product tour, a video or whatever, I think like those types of things are great uh, because that just opens up the conversation. But I guess the big thing that I think to your point is a fear that I hear all the time and you're totally right is maybe then they won't come in and fill out my book a demo form. Or maybe if I do that, demos will go down. I won't get as many demos. And I'm curious, like, how do you guys think about addressing that conversation? Like when that comes up, because I'm sure it does, right? Everyone's always worried if you give too much in front, that then they don't come back, like you said. How do you guys typically navigate that? Or is that an issue even? Is that something they should be worried about? We have heard time to time of, you know, my demos didn't necessarily skyrocket or stayed the same. What we say to that is sort of even, again, circling back away to the beginning of this conversation, we're all yeah. expected to do more with less right now. We all have smaller teams necessarily, or just like not as much time in the day. We want to be sending our best leads to our sales team. So generally when we, what we have heard is if it is less leads, it's because they're kind of filtering out those low quality leads or those window shoppers who yep. probably to begin with, if the second they hopped on a call, never really would have been a good fit. And often we hear that the leads that customers are getting from these demos are their highest quality and most educated. So I think this day and age, similar to you know wanting to be more upfront, meeting the buyers where they're at, it's also important for a good experience for your sales team and the buyer that they know what they're signing up for. So even oh, if you're getting a little less, probably better that it's people who actually want your product versus entirely misunderstood what you do. Well, exactly. Unless, you know, more leads isn't necessarily better, right? You know, it's what's the quality of those leads um, and how are they moving to the funnel? What are the conversion rates look like? All that good stuff. So even if leads were to go down, but then all of a sudden there's a lot more people that are coming in with a really great understanding of what your product does. That means the sales rep then now doesn't have to work quite as hard and answer all these questions that they typically get when they, when they didn't have that product tour on the website. But then likely the sales cycles are shorter. And I'm sure maybe you've got some great data on this and I'd love to follow more of it because I think you guys could totally do a kind of gong-like research center with all the cool data that you guys have and just share a lot of those insights. But, but yeah, that's exactly the type of thing we see too. We haven't had a, a ton of clients where we've done a lot of things related to like the ads like you and I were chatting about on LinkedIn. But uh, we've done it a little bit, and I think that there's there's definitely some improvements that at least we've seen, at least anecdotally, and just looking at some data, even though it's not perfect attribution or anything, that the quality has increased after we've done a better job educating the buyer, whether, again, it's in an ad channel or whether it's on the website. You can use that asset in both ways. So, um, so yeah, I don't know if you'd add anything to that, but, yeah, I totally agree. I think it's uh, spot on what you said. You read my mind about the shorter sales cycle. Um, we don't have, yeah. we're not gong just yet. We don't have aggregate as far as shortened sales cycle, but anecdotally yeah. we have heard customers say that sales cycle is cut in half with these leads. And it yeah. makes sense. You're eliminating that first call that's basically explaining what the product does or seeing if they're even a good fit. And then you can dive straight into personalizing the demo. So this is again, yeah. where you're not replacing the demo. If anything, you're making, sure that your best sellers, what they do best and showing them specific parts that go for their use cases. That's what they're doing rather than just doing these like overarching harbor tours. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, I could go on all day and continue this conversation. Any questions for me or things you think we didn't cover related to either ungated demos focusing or just some like last thoughts, anything you think we didn't get to, or you think we nailed it? I think we nailed it.
nailed it. Sweet. Well, cool. Well, then uh, I guess we'll continue the conversation on LinkedIn. If people want to follow you or learn more about Navitech, where's the best place to do that? Best place to learn more about me, not shockingly, is going to be LinkedIn. Uh, <laughs> let me know how yep. my organic content's doing as I'm working on it this year. Love any feedback. And then yep. if you want to learn more about Novatic, you can go to our website. You'll see we, not surprisingly, have an ungated demo of Novatic there, as well yep. as we have some top customer examples. Novatic. I'm going to remember that now. You should have called me out earlier. Now my pronunciation is going to be perfect moving forward. <laughs> no worries. The amount of people who say like Nevada or something, I'm, I'm just used to hearing it as Navatic as oh well. Oh my gosh. All right. Well, cool. Well, now we've got that straight. Well, cool. It was a pleasure having you. And then uh, we'll chat again here, I'm sure, soon on LinkedIn. Sounds good. Thanks so much for having me. Cheers.